Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Head into your local Safeway for great spring savings throughout the store. This week at Safeway, get yellow peaches or nectarines for the member price of $1.88 per pound. Also this week at Safeway, value packs of Signature Farms chicken drumsticks, thighs, leg quarters, or picnic packs are buy one, get one free. Plus, get value packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Top Sirloin Steak for the member price of $4.99 per pound. Visit Safeway.com, download the Safeway for You app, or head in store to find more great deals at Safeway. Welcome to Strategicon. Well done, John Brudy, and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Unfortunately, co-host David Oli can't be with us owing to his work and study commitments, but welcome to producer Michael Migali. G'day, Michael. G'day. How are you guys today? Good. Today's topic will be on a rapidly changing political space in Britain, and for this, we'll be joined again by our regular commentator on the UK, Commodore Patrick J. Tyrrell, OBERN retired. Pat is the chair of the SAGE International Advisory Board and SAGE's non-resident fellow, Global and Maritime Security. Pat, welcome back to The Focus. Hey, good day to you both. So, Pat, with a recent funeral service for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the UK's longest serving monarch, how long do you think it will take for the country to settle into the reign of King Charles III? Well, in many ways, it has already begun to settle. You know, you will have seen the pictures uh, and the videos of the uh, week of uh, general mourning and then the uh, funeral. And I think this has given the British people um, a unique opportunity to recognise everything that Her Majesty, late Majesty did and also show King Charles as the new monarch and to show that, you know, there are lots of people who are saying that the monarchy should skip a generation and I, of course this is because of social media William now the Prince of Wales um, is a very media savvy person he's grown up with it uh, he's highly personable he's got a charming wife who never seems to put a foot wrong and he's got a, a, a lovely family whereas Charles of course who is he is still a bit stiff and unbending in public, um, but he gave some really good speeches and um, an address to the Houses of Parliament and to other groupings that showed that this is a man who has indeed spent his 70 years of apprenticeship building upon his ideas and working out what he wanted to do when he was king. Of course, there are some things that bring you up short when, you know, someone gets up at a dinner and says, God save the king. You can feel them having to mentally concentrate so they don't get it wrong. Queen's Council, QC, are now known as King's Council. So there are bits and pieces. There, there have been a number of email scams trying to tell you that your money uh, with the Queen's head on is no longer um, valid and therefore please send your money to this address and we will reissue money with the King's head on it. You know, so obviously there are some hiccups on the way as far as money goes. Um, when I was young before decimalization in this country, 
we had Queen Victoria pennies circulating or King Edward the Seventh yeah. coin circulating. So there's been no change with the money. So I think actually it has been pretty smooth. Now the question is going to be what happens when we all come back down to earth and uh, start looking at what is going on uh, in our name and that might easily bring us back to Mary Elizabeth Truss as the new Prime Minister. Well, yeah, you know, it's uh, really interesting uh, in terms of this is, I think, the first time in a long time that Britain had such a change in terms of both the Prime Minister as well as uh, the monarch. Uh, well, so it's all sort of come together. There's been two monarchs in a week. And, and the interesting thing is that, of course, uh, as you uh, were indicating, you know, Liz Truss comes into the uh, comes into the prime minister's office with a bunch of problems dangling from her neck. Uh, you know, you've got the skyrocketing inflation issue. You've got, of course, the energy and food crisis due to the Russia-Ukraine war. You've got the support of Ukraine, the military support of Ukraine, which, of course, was. Um, done in great Churchillian swagger by former Prime Minister Johnson, and hopefully will probably continue under trust. But really, these are very big strategic problems to come into office, uh, you know, with, with these issues on your on your back, basically. How do you think trust is going to deal with all, with all of these things? Well, I suspect she's relying on the honeymoon effect. She has she has got a highly ambitious program, and it's one that's based on economic theory that is unorthodox. Now, she's going to go in, she's proposing to cut taxes, raise government spending, all in the hope that this will generate growth. It may happen. I mean, you know, her her economic theory is backed by one or two economists, not by the majority. But to some extent, you know, she's she's got nothing really to lose and everything to gain from this. If she'd carried on with the orthodox economic theories, we would have continued in the UK to suffer from low economic growth, high inflation, the issue of social welfare, being able to support people who need supporting. And um, she has got two years before there has to be a general election. Now, funnily enough, even Boris Johnson at the end of his term was not far behind the Labour Party, the major opposition, which implied that the British public actually didn't think much to either the Conservatives or the Labour Party. As we know, in a, in a democratic situation, you need to always have a party that looks as though it can assume government. Yes. Because otherwise the whole thing breaks down. Yes. You know, now you might have proportional representation and you might have have to have that negotiations between different parties because you have so many parties represented in in a parliament but even so that tends to mean that there's a coalesce around the center path it might be center left or center right but you know that's been traditionally the way it's been. Liz Truss has to show that the Conservative Party, which has, okay, it's done one or two things right, but it's not been covered in glory in many of its other activities. You know, it became the party associated with sleaze, um, mm. you know, with the parties at number 10, with a seeming disregard for what were the rules and norms. There have been a number of Conservative MPs who have been caught 
I won't say with their pants down, but um, in a way that is considered by the British people as unprofessional. So if she did exactly the same as what her predecessor had done in terms of policies, the chances of it working are very limited, very slim. And therefore, the Conservative Party would be voted out of office in two years' time. Pat, it sounds very much like the UK's in some major crisis because, again, if you look at the Labour Party and Keir Starmer and you, you look at Labour policy, it's not really the kind of policy that you'd want to try to address some of these deeper issues of inflation and, you know, food prices and, and energy prices. I mean, you know, and if you only have one or two economists who are backing Liz Truss, there's not going to be an answer from the conservative side of politics that's going to satisfy the British people. There will not be an alternative from the Labour that's the Labour Party that's going to satisfy the British people. The Liberal Democrats are, well, lost to the wilderness, shall we say. What is there for the British public to hold on to in these, these times of crisis? Well, I think let's take a step back. The problems you have described are problems that relate to, let's say, Sweden, to the United States, to, in fact, all liberal democracies at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, liberal democracies are great because, you know, when it's in a stable world, because they can make plans that will take years to develop and there's general consensus amongst the principal ruling parties that they can develop those policies over 10, 20 years. Liberal democracies are now facing this economic threat, this security threat, and are having to work out how to do it in a way that damages their populations to the least extent and of course the populations have over the last 25 years grown used to enjoying the fruits of a liberal democracy now you know if you look back how many people talk about high inflation uh, when i first bought a house i mean inflation was you know the interest rates were 15 16 percent you know, we, we've had 10 years of having rock bottom levels of interest rate, which has been marvellous if you want to buy a house. Mm-hmm. It's not been so good if you've been a pensioner living off your principal, you know, whereas in the past you could live off the income and now there's no income. So it's swings and roundabouts. Do I think we're in an existential crisis? No, I don't. We've just got lots of crises piled one on top of the other. You know, this is, in scientific, in engineering terms, this is the difference between complicated and complex. Because if you want to build, I don't know, a 747, for example, you could ring up Boeing and ask them to deliver all the parts, let's say two million parts, lay them out on your lawn at home, take an instruction booklet and fit piece A to piece B and then add C and so on and so forth, a bit like building an IKEA bookshelf. It's complicated, you know, because you've got to be, you know, very consistent, very uh, systematic at doing it. But we're in a complex situation, which is When you change something, something else also changes. So in a Boeing, when you're putting it together, part 55 remains static. It's a a lump of metal, let's say. It does a specific job. If you're in a complex organisation, like a living organisation, if you change part 55... Part 1,233 also changes because there's a dynamism about it. So, of course, when we change the 
economic organism, other bits change. So Liz Truss is intending to lower stamp duty, lower corporation tax, possibly lower income tax, you know, raise state benefits. Now, all of these act in a sort of symbiotic manner. And indeed, that's what Liz Truss is hoping. She's hoping that by changing the taxes, people are going to say, I've got more money. I'm going to go out and I'm going to set up my business. I am going to, you know, make widgets and sell them to the world. Pat, can I just say, you know, if that's true, then I would I would put forward a case that Liz Truss is doing what a conservative leader would normally do under these sort of circumstances. But as you pointed out earlier, a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is a sort of multiple layers of crisis. Can going back to basics and going back to traditional policy settings help address some of the things that we are currently seeing at the moment? Because I'm not sure whether or not that would be the case. I mean, uh, you're, you're very correct in saying that this it's not Britain alone that's suffering the slings and arrows of fate with regard to energy, food, and so on and so forth. Uh, other countries are as well. And you and I have both privately chatted about the lack of policy coherence in the West and the inability of political leaders to come forward with ideas necessary to prevent, if not overcome, crises that were at that time that we were talking about were just, you know, on the verge of breaking out rather than being, you know, because right now we're stuck in the middle of things. So your confidence that trust has got the measure of the situation? Um, I'm not sure she has the true measure of the situation. And in a paradoxical fashion, that's probably a good thing. Mm. Because I think if she knew what the true problems were, to which there are no standard answers, you know, that's why we go back to a degree of, orthodoxy, if you like, in terms mm -hmm. of the Conservative Party. How can right. I be a better Conservative Party member? Yep. Because that's, if you like, is felt to be a given. You know, that's what we did 40 years ago, and that worked. You know, mm -hmm. that's what we did in the 1970s. That's what we did in, in the early 2000s, and it worked. Whether it will work now remains to be seen. And I think if, you know, facing the issues that we're facing, let's add climate change on top of that. You know, after all, the UK has had its driest summer in 50 years, and there are problems and issues that are coming with that. I mean, other countries have had much worse. You know, look at Pakistan at the moment, yeah. look at the wildfires in California, look at the the drought mm -hmm. in California. So I think if Liz Truss knew the, knew the whole picture, he would not be able to do anything. There would be a paralysis at the top of government. There have been a lot of people on the BBC, as well as the local ABC here, talking about republicanism and that now that Queen Elizabeth um, has been put to rest, you know, any residual loyalties that Commonwealth countries had toward the British monarchy died with Her Majesty the Queen and will not automatically transfer across to King Charles III. Do you think this is just media speculation and, and hyperbole? Because uh, I think that there was a recent poll that was done here in Australia that suggests that, you know what, we're not rushing into republicanism here. Well, I think that... If we face facts, you can say that having, you know, a billionaire family, uh, having the perpetual rights to be the head of state of a country, sounds like a very odd thing to do. Mm. But then I look in this country, you know, President Jeremy Corbyn would fill me with <laughs> absolute horror, you know, because they're politicians. There are a whole load of 
politicians you could think out of as, you know, when, when they're no longer prime minister or secretary of state, you know, they decide they're going to stand um, as president of the country. Mm. And who are they? You know, what is it that they bring? They don't bring very much. Whereas the head of state is a person who can hold the nation together. Now, that must be someone who has a a historical background is the wrong term, but comes from deep down within the nation's psyche. Mm. And it happens that having a monarch comes from deep down. They represent, they don't represent Charles Windsor, or Elizabeth Windsor, they represent the feelings of, you know, millions of people in that particular country. And I think we saw it in the remarkable response to the death of Her Late Majesty. And I think that, you know, as long as the head of state doesn't get involved in setting policy, which is clearly a political thing to do, and acts as a figurehead, it's not a job I'd like, I have to say, but, you know, acts as a figurehead, then that is something around which a nation can coalesce. Now, if Charles starts writing his spidery notes, saying you must do this and you must do that, he said he won't, so, you know, and I believe him, Mm -hmm. um, then you would have your head of state moving into the political camp, in which case you might just as well say, well, let's put an ex-politician in that role. Yeah. Is there a is there a danger that King Charles may go down that direction? Because you, you mentioned earlier, you know, climate change, and he's very much the champion of things green. So do you think that, you know, his passion for renewable energy and various other bits and pieces would stray into the political aspect of policy oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think Prince Charles has been, King Charles, has been mm. consistent um, since he was in his early 20s. I mean, he was deeply unpopular. You know, people said, oh, he talks to plants and, you know, he's doing this and that. And, and actually, you know, he was trying to warn that we were using the Earth's resources to our complete detriment. And people ignored him. And I think that, you know, he's he's a bit like a, a state version of David Attenborough, you know, <laughs> you know, producing these great natural history programs. And another thing I want to bring up is whether or not there are international diplomatic benefits to um, having a a monarch who is seen as being truly independent. I think that if you look back at the work the Queen did, she was very influential in a a apolitical manner. She would bring people together. She had that ability when meeting people to make the people she met feel that they were important and as on an equal par with Her Majesty the Queen. She would put you at ease. She would defuse, if you like, international tensions. And I think from that point of view, whereas in international politics, when one president meets another president, they know they are political beasts. When Her Majesty the Queen or His Majesty the King meet presidents, they know that the King or Queen is independent and therefore will tend to be more prepared to discuss the real issues rather than showcasing you know, their particular political point. 
You know, Pat, uh, a, a number of other issues flow from what we've recently witnessed in the UK, which is actually quite historic. And that is, you know, the the situation with regard to Scotland. I mean, I hear that Nicholas, Nicola Sturgeon is uh, stirring the pot yet again with regard to Scottish independence. Maybe she thinks that uh, Merry Old England is fatally wounded by the loss of the Queen and, and with Liz Truss in, in number 10. What are your thoughts? I think that uh, with all due respect to um, Nicola Sturgeon, she's got this E-Day fix on independent Scotland and believes that independence will solve all of Scotland's problems. Now, at the moment, the Scottish government controls quite a few of the levers of power. It receives a large amount of money through a very complicated thing called the Barnet formula, which adjusts for money received so that the wealthier southeast around London contributes towards Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. And yet she can't manage social expenditure in a way that gives tangible results. Waiting lists are longer in Scotland. Drug deaths are higher in Scotland. Education is poorer and has been dropping in Scotland. If she wants to have independence and if the people of Scotland want to have independence, then she needs to fix her own house um, before moving out, because otherwise they will not be able to deliver the right sort of level to the Scottish people. Problem is that she turns it into this emotional type of thing, saying it's going to be much better when we're out of Scotland. So finally, Pat, what's your view on the situation with regard to Northern Ireland? Do you think that there is... uh, some form of, I don't know, policy setting that can be put forward that'll make everything easy between the EU and Ireland proper? Well, this is where I I feel that Boris Johnson, the former prime minister, having agreed a protocol for leaving the EU, then finds it doesn't work and tries to change it. Of course, You know, we need to bear in mind what uh, Winston Churchill said, which is George Orr is better than war war. So we need to be talking to the EU about the practical problems. And there are some real practical problems because this protocol set up the customs border in the Irish Sea. So anything going to Northern Ireland, which is a province of the United Kingdom, is subject to the same rules as the EU. That means we can't supply normal pharmacy things to the Northern Ireland people unless they've been approved of by the EU, even though those pharmacy products are not going to go into the Republic of Ireland. So there needs to be a debate. And I know Liz Truss... She is aggressive. She is abrasive. Uh, She will attack rather than debate to start with. And therefore, she is saying we're going to have this ability to disregard the protocol, to be able to do what we want to do. But at some Mm. stage, you're going to have to negotiate with the EU. (laughs) So why don't we do it first? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, Pat, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you very much for your time and thanks for sharing your insights on Strategicon. Well, that's a pleasure, John. My thanks to our guest, Pat Turrell, and to producer Michael Magali and to the Oscast Network. To our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can also watch our podcasts on video through the Strategic on Raw YouTube channel when they're available. Easily 
accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Until next time, it's goodbye from me, John Bruni. You've been listening to Strategicon, a Sage International podcast. Oscast. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.